Welcome to the BHPC Pulpit Supplemental uh, number two. Today we're going to look at uh, Louis Burkhoff and his excellent work on uh, systematic theology. Uh, this is uh, the section on infant baptism. And I'd like to just read this through and uh, make some comments along the way here. I think this is a very uh, straightforward, relatively easy to understand um, presentation, and I hope that uh, you'll find it to be uh, edifying and helpful um, as I read it and a uh, comment along the way. I still have my original uh, Burkhoff back there on my systematic, you can probably see the systematics shelf back there, my original copy of that from um, more than 20 years ago, um, where I've got it all marked up um, in that particular section, <laughs> and uh, really, really useful. That, that was extremely useful for me personally uh, to finally understand um, not just uh, sacraments in general, um, but uh, sacramental theology and the, the really excellent, uh, thoroughly biblical, reformed, classical reformed way of looking at it, uh, I think is far superior to uh, anything else that, I, that I've ever read or studied over the years or heard, uh, even in recent times. So listen to uh, Burkhoff here, and I hope that uh, this will be helpful to you. Um, point number two, and this is in the section on um, the proper subjects of baptism, letter F under, um, I think this is under just the means of grace of the church. Infant baptism. It is on the point of infant baptism that the most important difference is found between us and the Baptists. The latter hold, as Dr. Hovey, a Baptist author, expresses it, that only believers in Christ are entitled to baptism and that only those who give credible evidence of faith in him should be baptized. End quote. This means that children are excluded from the sacrament. In all other denominations, however, they receive it. Several points call for consideration in connection with this subject. Okay, point A, the scriptural basis for infant baptism. It may be said at the outset that there is no explicit command in the Bible to baptize children and that there is not a single instance in which we are plainly told that children were baptized. But this does not necessarily make infant baptism unbiblical. The scriptural ground for it is found in the following data. Now, I hope that um, people will listen carefully to this because you'll probably, if you've heard me talk about this before um, or present this in debate format, um, you'll recognize this. The covenant made with Abraham was primarily a spiritual covenant, though it also had a national aspect. And of this spiritual covenant, circumcision was a sign and seal. It is an unwarranted procedure of the Baptists to split this covenant up into two or three different covenants. The Bible refers to the covenant with Abraham several times, but always in the singular. Now, I want to I read through these references. This is, um, these were extremely helpful to me long ago. Exodus 2.24, So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. See how berit? Covenant, the Hebrew term there is singular, not his covenants, but his covenant with Abraham. Okay, Leviticus, um, what was that? Leviticus uh, 26, 42. Then I will remember my covenant, singular, with Jacob, and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember, I will remember, and I will remember the land. Okay, so there's one covenant, one promise that God makes there with Abraham. Uh, Burkhoff continues, <clears throat> There is not a single exception to this rule. The spiritual nature of this covenant is proved by the manner in which its promises are interpreted in the New Testament. Now, this is where I think one of the big differences, at least that I've detected before, um, I've, heard, I've heard John MacArthur say twice. Uh, he said it in his interview with Ben Shapiro, um, and he also said it in a, a actually a really good sermon series he did on, on um, eschatology on the future of Israel, which most of which I actually agreed with. But he made the, has made the statement that, quote, there are many people who think that the key to understanding the Old Testament is the New Testament. This is not true, end quote. That's what he said to Ben Shapiro. And I definitely um, would have a very serious disagreement with that. I think the key to understanding the Bible is the Bible. Uh, scripture is its own best interpreter. In fact, I just I, I listened to a, a really good lecture by Richard Barcellos called Getting the Garden Right, and what he said in there was just outstanding. He made the point that if the New Testament refers to something in the Old Testament, now, now Barcellos is a Reformed Baptist, but what he said was right on the money. He said when the New Testament refers to something in the Old Testament, that is what it means, and you need to you need to look carefully at the way the New Testament writers interpret 
the Old Testament passages, um, who would be a better interpreter of God than God himself? And so I'm always going to go with the New Testament's interpretation of things and not with, um, not with my own understanding or my own interpretation of those things. So I want to read um, a few of these uh, passages. Let me set up my desktop here. It'll make it a little more easy to follow here. Okay. Let me get back down here. Okay. Um, here, just listen to Burkhoff again. <clears throat> the spiritual mm -hmm. nature of this covenant... <clears throat> The spiritual nature of this covenant is proved by the manner in which its promises are interpreted in the New Testament. Okay, so how does the Apostle Paul understand? How does he understand the promises made to Abraham? Does he understand it in terms of the only thing Abraham, Abraham was just looking forward to his physical descendants inheriting the land of Canaan? Is that the way the New Testament writers understand it? Is that the way Jesus understands it? Clearly not. Listen to Romans 4.16. <laughs> Therefore, it is a faith, meaning justification is a faith, that it might be according to grace, so that the promise, there you have the singular promise, might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Okay, not just the nation of Israel, but many nations, plural. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope and hope believes, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. When God told Abraham in Genesis 15, after Abraham complains at the beginning of that chapter, I, I have no children, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, God says, look at the stars and count them if you can, so shall your descendants be. What is God talking about there? What, what is he promising him? The way Paul understands it is, that's all the elect. That's every single person before and after the coming of Christ that would truly be redeemed. That's all of the elect. That is the invisible church. Who are the children of Abraham? Only those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. That's the way the New Testament writers understand the Old Testament. Now, I remember reading Burkhoff here years ago, and then later on I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a whole other video on A.A. A. Hodge. I think his stuff on this is, is outstanding too. <clears throat> and I remember thinking, how could how could Abraham what like what exactly did he believe about Jesus? I mean, what what did he know about the gospel? What what did he know about about God's plan of redemption? Well, it's very clear that Abraham knew that all of the nations of the of the world, all the families of the earth, would be blessed in him as opposed to cursed in Adam. That one of his descendants was going to, by in and of himself, bring blessedness to all the families of the earth. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, those, those opening promises that God makes in the, the Abrahamic um, period. You know, Genesis 1 to 11 is the you know, creation, fall, flood, uh, Tower of Babel, the dispersion of the nations. And then you know, that huge swath of, of history is covered in 11 chapters. And then you get to the call of Abram. <clears throat> In Genesis 12, and then God makes promises to him in Genesis 12, and Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 22, etc., etc., etc. And so, but but all of it is one covenant. It's a it's a covenant promise that God's going to save this vast multitude of people. So shall your descendants be. Now, why why am I saying that? Why am I saying that is what this means? Because that's what the New Testament says it means. And I'm always going to go with the God breathed interpretation of this stuff. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't look at this. I don't look at the Old Testament and go, ah, he, he was just looking forward to his physical descendants inheriting the land of Canaan. That's not what the New Testament tells us he was looking forward to. In fact, Jesus himself told his opponents at the Feast of Tabernacles in John 8, um, Abraham was looking forward to my day. Indeed, he saw it and was glad. Abraham was looking forward to the coming of Christ, just like David was. Just like we look back to the coming of Christ. <coughs> Pardon me. So Romans 4, 16 to 18, listen to another passage. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18. And what agreement has the temple of God with, with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. You really, you, you could um, summarize the whole Bible with, with that. The, the, the entire Bible could be summarized as, I will be your God and you will be my people. It's the story of how God is glorifying his grace and, of course, he's going to glorify his justice with the reprobate. But it's God saving a people to be his very own. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's Leviticus 26.12. 
Uh, Exodus um, 29, 45, I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. Leviticus 26, 12, I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. Exodus 6, verse 7, so right when, when God starts doing the, the plagues or um, actually that's right before he starts doing the plagues. That's Exodus chapter 6 is amazing because Moses goes back to, to the Lord uh, after he went into Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And then Pharaoh makes their lives even more miserable and tells them to make bricks without straw. And then God says, you watch what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. It's an amazing passage. Okay. So second Corinthians six, uh, 16 or 17. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So that's how the New Testament writers interpret those promises to Abraham. Uh, Galatians 3.8. Here is another one. This one really, in fact, I remember where I was on the highway, <laughs> on the bus, going to work in downtown Cincinnati you know, more than 20 years ago, reading this section and looking up in my Bible. Um, this passage, Galatians 3.8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Now that's Genesis 12, verse 3. That's one of the first things God says to Abram. He says, I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's why Abraham was looking forward to not his physical descendants inheriting physical land somewhere, but to the coming of the Messiah who would bring salvation to all the families of the world, who would bring blessing to all the families of the world instead of curse. Remember, the, the whole Testament, you can look at, look at everything in terms of blessing and curse. Everyone is either under God's blessing, they're blessed in Christ, or they're cursed in Adam. Okay, so there's, there's another one. So Galatians 3, 8 and verse 9. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. And then verse 14 of Galatians 3, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What is that blessing of Abraham? It's what Genesis 12, 3 says, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, justified before God, accounted as righteous, and adopted into God's family. You will be my sons and my daughters. That's how they understand the Old Testament. And I'm always going to go with what the New Testament writers say. They, they are the, the default for me. And, you know, that, that lecture by Richard Barcells is, was just outstanding. I mean, he just nails it on that point. When the New Testament alludes to something in the Old Testament or comments on it, that is what it means. And that's what we have to go with. And we can't think that we're smarter than God or that we, we understand it better. Okay, Hebrews chapter 8, another um, illustration of this. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see, that I will be their God, they shall be my people. New Covenant and the Abrahamic Covenant are essentially identical to one another. They're essentially identical to each other in terms of what they promise. Th this idea that the New Covenant is the only covenant in which this is true, that God puts his laws on their hearts and, and regenerates people and things like that, that is manifestly not the case. Okay, circumcision is a sign of regeneration. We're going we're to see that here in a moment as we look through some of those passages. But the idea that the new covenant is the covenant of grace, and it's the only covenant that has regeneration, that is manifestly false and demonstrably uh, easily shown to be false. Um, regeneration is right there in the Old Testament. That whole concept, I will be their God and they will be my people, that necessitates regeneration. They will be my sons and my daughters. That necessitates regeneration. That, that Abraham believed in Yahweh and it was accounted to him as righteousness. That necessitates regeneration. And circumcision is a sign of regeneration. Circumcision is circumcision of the heart in the spirit. Okay. Okay. Um, verse, uh, okay, Hebrews uh, 11, 9. Hebrews 11, 9. Another, yeah, the whole chapter here about faith, what the Old Testament believers are looking forward to. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And then uh, Hebrews 11, uh, verse 10. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my bad, my bad. Yeah, I meant Hebrews 11, 9. <coughs> By faith, Abraham dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. 
what what is it he telling us there? Abraham was not looking forward to his physical descendants dwelling in that land. He dwelt in it as in a foreign country. He was looking forward to it, what? He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What was Abraham looking forward to? Heaven. He was looking forward to heavenly glory. That's what he was looking forward to. He was looking forward to the coming of Christ. Salvation. Grace. Jesus. All that. Uh, Hebrews 11, um, 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Okay, Burkhoff continues. It also follows from the fact that circumcision was clearly a rite that had spiritual significance. Okay, Deuteronomy 10, 16. Deuteronomy 10, 16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. What is circumcision a sign of? Regeneration. Of the, the cutting away of the, the, the sinful foreskin of your heart. Okay, it's talking about the renewal of the inner man. Be stiff-necked no longer. Be, be obedient. <clears throat> be what circumcision is a sign of. Be um, stiff-necked no longer. Okay, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Now, if that's not regeneration, what is it? Lo the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God. Everyone that's born into this world in their sinful nature is a God-hater by nature. We're a God-hater by nature. We are rebellious by nature. We are children of wrath by nature, Ephesians 2, 3 says. So for a person to go from hating God and being rebellious to loving God and obeying him from their heart, that's regeneration. God changing the heart. God making us alive in Christ. Uh, they had the very same benefits um, back then that we have now. Very same benefits. Okay? So that's Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Uh, yeah, another one, that, the Jeremiah one, Jeremiah 4, 4. I, I still remember looking these up years ago. Because, because I wanted to say, no, 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 circumcision is just a, a sign of inheriting the land of Canaan. It's just a sign of, of earthy, temporal land promises and things like that. It's not the way the Old Testament describes it. It's not the way the Old Testament itself describes it. And it's not the way the New Testament writers describe it either. Jeremiah 4, 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. You see, what does it sound like? Does it sound like circumcision is just a sign that you're genealogically connected to Israel and that you have a right to get into this land? That's not what circumcision means. In fact, Paul says in Romans 4, 11, circumcision was a sign and seal of the righteousness that Abraham had by faith. And I would extend that. It was also a sign and seal of the righteousness David had by faith, although David was circumcised as an infant. Okay, Jeremiah 9, 25. It's another one. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Okay, they're speaking about those who, um, who truly know God versus those who don't. Listen, the next verse brings it out too. Egypt, Judah, Edom, and the people of Ammon, Moab, and all who are in the farthest corners who dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. That there's that, that Hebrew term, uh, lave. That means the inner man, the heart, the mind, the inner, the inner man. It's translated into the Septuagint as cardia. The, the heart of man. Our hearts need to be made alive. They need to be renewed. The heart of stone needs to become a heart of flesh. You see what that's talking about? What is circumcision talking about? It's talking about the renewal of the heart. It's talking about regeneration. Okay? The, the regeneration is not new to the new covenant. Okay? And to say that, well, that's the only covenant that has regeneration, that is manifestly not true. Manifestly not true. Okay. Now another passage, um, Acts 15, verse 1. And I want to make a, a little sidebar comment here too. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay. <clears throat> now, I've heard many people say, hey, if baptism replaces circumcision, Jerusalem Council could have been over in five seconds. They could have stood up and said, Hey, baptism replaces circumcision. See ya. And um, that, that's a common argument. People say, well, baptism, if, if it really is the replacement sign for circumcision, the Jerusalem Council could have been solved in, in a matter of seconds. 
But think about what they're disputing. What, what, why did they get together and have this, this big meeting at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15? Listen to what it says in verse 1. Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now what good would it have done for someone to say, Baptism replaces circumcision. See ya. Then they would have thought, Oh, unless you're baptized, you cannot be saved. Don't, I, I hope people that, that make that argument, John MacArthur made that argument against R.C. Sproul, and I've also heard others make that argument. Um, I hope you can see that saying baptism replaces circumcision would not, would not have answered this question. The, the error was people were saying that you had to, you had to be, become really Jewish. You had to keep dietary laws and obey the, the moral laws themselves and also be circumcised according to the custom of Moses. Unless you do that, you can't be saved saying, well, baptism is the replacement for circumcision now, that wouldn't answer the question. That still wouldn't answer the question. They, they, would, they would have left the question unanswered. What they needed to point out is justification is by faith. Now, don't unnecessarily offend Jews. Like, don't, don't eat things strangled in their blood and that kind of stuff. That's why they say that in the decree that they send out. But simply pointing out that baptism replaces circumcision would not have solved this problem. And so it really it's a strange thing to hear People say that, well, all we had to do was say baptism replaces circumcision. That wouldn't have answered the question. The question they were facing was, people were teaching, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay, saying baptism replaces circumcision would not have answered that question. They needed to point out that justification, being saved, is by faith alone, by believing in the gospel alone. Okay, Burkhoff uh, continues here. He cites, uh, yeah, another passage, real important one. Romans 2, 26-29. Listen to this. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. You see the way that the apostles themselves interpret the Abrahamic covenant and the, the promise that God made in it? This is about regeneration. Circumcision is circumcision of the heart. What, how, does the, the, how do the prophecies of the new covenant uh, talk about this? I will take out the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, and I will write my laws on their hearts, etc. It's the same thing in, prior to the coming of Christ. Same uh, promises. Okay. <clears throat> It also follows from the fact that circumcision was clearly a rite that had spiritual significance. Okay, that's I just read all those passages. Now look at listen to Romans four eleven. It's always it's for twenty years it's been fascinating to listen to the other side tell us what this passage is really saying. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Okay, circumcision is a, is a sign of what? Justification by faith. Personal salvation. And yet it was given to babies that couldn't make profession of faith? Yep, it was. And at the end of the book of Exodus, I pointed this out also many, many times. Um, Exodus 12, um, I think it's verse 46 and following. Yeah, verse 48. When a stranger, this is it, right, right before the people leave Israel, God gives them a provision for non-Jews, non-Israelites, to become part of the church. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. And so God has a provision here for non-Jews, for Gentiles, to become part of the church. And what do they have to do? All their males have to be circumcised first. The whole household has to be circumcised. What does that remind you of? Um, circumcision function functioned exactly the same way baptism does now. Um, because it's the same God, same gospel, same promises, same mediator, same benefits, same conditions. Justification is by faith, repentance, um, regeneration, uh, adoption as sons and daughters. I will be your God and you shall be my sons and my daughters. You will be my people. There's unity to the gospel. Unity to the one covenant of grace that unfolds across um, the various covenants. Okay, and from the fact that the promise of the covenant is even called the gospel. I mean, Paul says that. Galatians 3.8. Abraham had the gospel preached to him. I remember reading that 
coming around the bend um, towards downtown right before I got to my job when I was a computer programmer. Abraham had the gospel preached to him. And then it started hitting me. Yeah, yeah. He, he was looking forward to all the families of the earth being blessed as opposed to cursed. And he was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. It, it all makes sense now. He, Hebrews 11, same things. Yeah, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He wasn't looking forward to physical people inheriting physical land. He was looking forward to heaven itself. That's the way the New Testament describes it for us. Okay, number two. Now listen carefully to this. This is very, very, very important in, in Burkhoff. This covenant is still in force. Now what was he talking about? The Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. This covenant is still in force and is essentially identical with the new covenant of the present dispensation. Now, a while back, I was recommended to read a little book called A Reformed Baptist Manifesto by Sam Waldron. And when I got it, um, it's, it's a real short paperback, I started plowing into it, and I saw there's, there's a chapter on paedo-baptism. And in the opening sentences of that chapter, he says, when one considers the standard arguments of Burkhoff and A.A. A. Hodge. And I thought, wow, he's actually going to address our position. I've never heard a Reformed Baptist do that. Never. I have never heard a Baptist actually interact with our position. And started looking at it. And what he says is, he, he cites this page of Burkhoff and says, they say that the new covenant is, quote, essentially identical, end quote, with the old covenant. And I just kind of sighed and thought, seriously? You look at this page number in Burkhoff. This covenant is still in force. What, what, is this what is the antecedent of this covenant? The covenant made with Abraham. Not the Mosaic covenant. The covenant made with Abraham. Is still in force and is essentially identical with the new covenant. Now listen to the passages that he, he cites here. Listen. The unity and continuity of the covenant in both dispensations follows from the fact that the mediator is the same. The mediator is the same in both covenants, ultimately. Peter said in Acts 4.12, There is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What was David looking forward to? The coming of Christ. What was Abraham looking forward to? The coming of Christ. John 8.56. Listen to what Jesus himself teaches us about Abraham and what Abraham thought, what Abraham believed in. Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So, what was Abraham looking forward to? What did he rejoice at the thought of? The Messiah, the Savior, Jesus. That's what Jesus tells us. I think we should probably believe him. We should agree with Jesus when he says this. He goes on here, Acts, um, Acts 10.43. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Who are all the prophets? Moses, all the Old Testament writers, all of them, bear witness that through Christ, he who believes in him will receive remission of sins. You can't miss it. It's all over the place in the Old Testament. Uh, Acts, or, uh, Genesis 12, 3. In you, Abraham, in one of your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. They will be blessed now as opposed to cursed. That, that implies... They'll have all their sins forgiven and be accepted as righteous in God's sight. The prophets all bear witness to it. How many, I mean, Isaiah is called the fifth evangelist because it's like, it's almost like reading passion narratives. You read Isaiah 53, you read the servant songs in Isaiah. I mean, those are talking about Christ and they're talking about what he's going to do uh, to save people from their sins. In fact, Isaiah 53, to me, is the clearest teaching on substitutionary atonement in the whole Bible, including the New Testament. I mean, it is as clear as it could possibly be. Uh, in fact, in the death of death and the death of Christ, John Owen uh, keys in on the fact that by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. And he, he draws the, the, the very close grammatical uh, parallel there. The ones that are justified are justified because Christ bore their iniquities. That's why you cannot believe that Jesus did that for every single human being. Because every single person for whom he died will be justified before God because their sin is completely punished and righteousness is achieved for them. So, but but I, don't, I don't want to get off into limited atonement there, but the, the clear teaching um, of the Bible is that the Old Testament is completely about Christ. That's what Jesus said over and over again in, in the Gospel of Luke. We're, uh, looking forward to getting to those passages. In John chapter 5, these are the scriptures which testify of me, he says, I think it's John 5, 29. Uh, Luke 24, on the road, um, on, the, on the Emmaus road, 
beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them everything in the scriptures concerning himself. The whole thing is about him, and the people in the Old Testament were looking forward uh, to the coming of Christ. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I started uh, preaching there a little bit. Um, so then, let's see. Yeah, the mediator is the same. Okay, um, listen to Acts 15.10. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. I, that is one of the clearest denials that the law plays any role in our justification whatsoever. We're not saved by the yoke of, of law keeping and dietary laws and, and all the rest of it, but rather it's by grace. If we're saved by grace, we're not saved by works. If, it, if it's grace then it is not anything that we do at all. It is through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we shall be saved. That's the Acts, the Jerusalem Council there, Acts 15, verses 10 and 11. Galatians 3, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So what was, what was the Abrahamic covenant primarily about? Jesus Christ. The, so shall your descendants be, Abraham. Well, who is that? All the elect that will ever be saved in the entire history of the world to come. In fact, what's what's amazing to me is that the Apostle Paul, as I to, as I recall, just searching my, my memory banks here, he refers to the new covenant twice in his entire corpus of writings. It's in 2 Corinthians 3, I think, where he's contrasting when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and his face shone and the old covenant had that much glory. How much greater does the new covenant, we are ministers of the new covenant, and so on. And the only other place he refers to the new covenant is in 1 Corinthians 11 when he's giving instructions from the Lord's Supper and he's quoting Jesus at the, the institution of the Lord's Supper. This is the new covenant in my blood. Other than that, Paul doesn't, doesn't um, explain the gospel in terms of the new covenant. He explains it exclusively in terms of the Abrahamic promise. That's how Paul explains it. That's why to say that the Abrahamic covenant is the old covenant that has expired and is passing away is not biblically tenable. That's not a, a proper way of understanding redemptive history. Okay, 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. There is one God and one mediator between God and men. That was true before the coming of Christ, too. That's why Abraham was looking forward to that mediator. David was looking forward to that mediator. All the prophets, Moses and all the prophets, bear witness to the coming of this mediator. He is the only one, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And then uh, 1 Peter 1. This is the passage about the, pro the prophets that were searching what manner of time. Um, the, the Christ would come. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. What is that talking about? Who are the prophets? All the authors of the Old Testament. All the authors of the Old Testament prophesied of what? The grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. What's the whole Old Testament about? The sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. That's what the whole thing's about. It's about the gospel. It's about the coming of Christ. Abraham had the gospel preached to him. Galatians 3.8. Hebrews 4.2. Israel had the gospel preached to them. Okay. Um, pressing on here. So the mediator is the same. The, the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant are essentially identical to one another. Because the mediator is the same. The condition is the same. Namely, faith. Genesis 15, 6, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So there you have the gospel, right there. How does Paul defend the gospel in Romans chapter 4? Romans chapter 4, verse 3. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Do you, do you see the unity of the gospel here? I remember it was just so refreshing to go through all this years ago. I went through these passages and marked them all up in my New Geneva Study Bible. And just saw this glorious unity. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of the coming of Christ. The Old Testament saints and believers, the Old Testament church, was looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. That's what the Abrahamic covenant's all about. Pressing on here. Uh, so the condition is still the same. Faith, Psalm uh, 32, verse 10. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord... Mercy shall uh, surround him. He who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. That's faith. Um, <clears throat> Hebrews 2, 4. 
God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Um, Acts 10, 43, 43. To him all the prophets bear witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Faith is the condition. All the prophets bore witness to it. The Old Testament bears witness to it. Genesis 15, 6 bears witness to it. Habakkuk 2, 4 bears witness to it. Isaiah 53 bears witness to it. The servant songs and the rest of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Amos, all of them bear witness to this. Deuteronomy does. The, the whole Old Testament does. The Psalms bear witness to it. Okay? Um, Hebrews 11, the whole chapter, by faith, 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 faith. Faith was the condition. Is that was the condition of being right with God uh, prior to the coming of Christ. And the blessings are the same, namely justification. When Paul explains justification, what does he cite from? Genesis 15, 6 in uh, Romans 4, 3. And then in Romans 4, 8 through 10, what does he cite? Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. So the blessings of this covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, which is essentially identical to the new, the blessings are identical to each other. The mediator is the same, the condition is the same, the benefits, the blessings are the same, justification, right there, uh, Isaiah 1.18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What is that talking about? That's the gospel. That's forgiveness of sins. That's the person who is, is covered with blood in their sin being made white as snow through the grace of God, through the gospel. Um... Romans 4, 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. So whether you're a Jew or not, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, it is by faith that a person is made right with God, whether they're Jew or, or Gentile. Uh, Galatians 3, 6. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, there was he citing again. Genesis 15, 6. What is the Old Testament about? I mean, when I hear someone say, Abraham was just looking forward to, the, to his physical descendants inheriting the land of Canaan. I'm like, what Bible are you reading? What Bible are you reading? How does the New Testament and the Old Testament, how do they understand what these promises are really about? It's about the gospel. It's about individuals being saved. That's what it's all about. Regeneration is another one. Here, here's another one. This is another reason why the idea that the new covenant alone has regeneration in it is just not the case. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. What is regeneration? How is it pictured in Jeremiah and in other places in the Old Testament in Ezekiel 11? It is the taking out of a heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh. It is the circumcision of the heart. That's what that is. That's regeneration. Okay, Psalm 51.10, David's great penitential song. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Um, it also contains with it the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant, uh, the, the giving of spiritual gifts. Joel 2.28, it shall come to pass, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Okay, and continuing on, um, Acts 2.17-21. to uh, 21. Whoops. Acts 2, 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. And all my men servants and all my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, etc. Okay, so the, whoops. So the benefits are, are the same. Um, spiritual gifts, regeneration, justification, and eternal life. Exodus 3, verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Um, Exodus 3, 6 is quoted by Jesus uh, against the Sadducees, when he points out God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, um, which is pretty amazing that I am the God of your father, uh, the God of Abraham. Abraham is alive in Christ in, in heavenly glory uh, when he said that to Moses there at the burning bush in Exodus 3. Uh, Hebrews 4, 9. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. That's eternal life. That's what that's talking about. Our eternal rest. Our eternal uh, rest there. Hebrews eleven ten. 
For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder maker is God. What was Abraham looking forward to? Going to heaven. The city of God. The new heavens and the new earth. The, the restoration of all things. Burkhoff continues. Peter gave those who were under conviction on the day of Pentecost the assurance that the promise was unto them and to their children in Acts 2.39. Paul argues in Romans 4, 13 to 18, and Galatians 3, 13 to 18, that the giving of the law did not make the promise of none effect so that it still holds in the new dispensation. So the giving of the law as part of the Mosaic covenant, which was not, which, which did not in any way, shape, or form alter the gospel, okay, that, that's why we say it's part of the covenant of grace. So it doesn't seem to, to matter how many times I say that. It's just not going to register but but anyway the giving of the law did not alter the promise it, it like when when men make a covenant you can't annul it or add to it later the giving of the law was done in the context of redemption from egyptian bondage it was given as the way for the people of god to show gratitude to god to, for for having saved them out of that bondage etc doesn't alter the promise in any way shape or form listen to the passages listen to how paul understands it here romans 4 13 for the promise that he would be heir of the world not just of the land of Canaan, but the heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law, that is those who are trying to earn it by law keeping, if they are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And then Galatians 3, 13 to 18, here's, if, if people want to know, how, how do I understand the, the, the role of the law in the Mosaic Covenant, and, and the way that it's, plays out in redemptive history here is my answer to that christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of abraham might come upon the gentiles in christ jesus that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith brethren i speak in the manner of men though it is only a man's covenant yet if it is confirmed no one annuls or adds to it okay you see what Paul's saying there? The unconditional, unilateral promises that God made, swearing a, a self-maledictory oath with the smoking fire pot that comes down between the pieces, there is nothing that can be added to that or subtracted from it later. Nothing can be added to it or subtracted from it later. No one annuls or adds to it. So the Mosaic Covenant does not alter the gospel. It doesn't alter the gospel. Justification is still by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone, before the Mosaic Covenant and after the Mosaic Covenant. <clears throat> he goes on to say, And to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, And to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Okay, so I think that's, that's not overly hard to understand. Burkhoff continues. Paul argues in Romans 4, 13 to 18, and Galatians 3, 13 to 18, that the giving of the law did not make the promise of none effect, so that it still holds in the new dispensation. And the writer of Hebrews points out that the promise to Abraham was confirmed with an oath so that the New Testament believers may derive comfort from its immutability. Now, this is a passage I quoted um, when, I, when I attempted to debate Brandon Adams. I pointed out, when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Abrahamic covenant was a self-maledictory oath God swore by passing through the severed halves of those animals. I will make this happen. Okay? The Abrahamic covenant is not the old covenant. 
It is immutable. It is still in force. It is the everlasting covenant. Now, what Hebrews 8 goes on to say is that the new covenant is being contrasted with the old covenant. What covenant's that? That's a different covenant. That's the covenant at Mount Sinai. In fact, it, it explicitly says that in Hebrews 8, uh, verse 8. Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. What covenant's that? The, the covenant he made with the people of Israel when he took them out of Egypt. That's the Sinaitic covenant. That's the Mosaic covenant. Okay, the new covenant is not being contrasted with the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is immutable. cannot be changed at all. That's why Paul's entire discussion of justification is in terms of a fulfillment, a direct fulfillment of the promises God made to Abraham. Listen to what the rest of Hebrews 8 says. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, is that is that new? Is that something no one's ever heard before? Is that brand new? What is Leviticus 26, 12? I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. It's not new. This is not unique to the New Covenant. We, we look at that and say, what's new about that? This is simply the post-Advent administration of the one covenant of grace that's given to us um, in Scripture. And we know there's only one covenant of grace because there's only one way anyone's ever been made right with God. By grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone. Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed in Yahweh and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Okay, point number three in Burkhoff here. In, in light of these things so far. And if you, if you recognize some of this, because you've listened to me preach before, this is where I got a lot of this. I think that Burkhoff is correct. Um, I remember working through every one of these passages, and you, you see you see the unity there. I, I think it's unmistakable. It's, it's, it's very hard to deny it. By the appointment of God, infants shared in the benefits of the covenant, and therefore received circumcision as a sign and seal. According to the Bible, the covenant is clearly an organic concept, and its realization moves along organic and historical lines. There is a people or nation of God, an organic whole such as could only be con constituted by families. This national idea is naturally very prominent in the Old Testament, but the striking thing is that it did not disappear when the nation of Israel had served its purpose. It was spiritualized and thus carried over into the New Testament, so that the New Testament people of God are also represented as a nation. Now listen to these passages. Matthew uh, 21, verse 43. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Okay, Romans 9, 25. Oops. 9, 25. And he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Now, compare that with Hosea 2:23. Then I will show, sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. Okay, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, we've already read that passage, Titus uh, 2, 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, this own special nation, this own, his own special group, zealous for good works. Okay, and then 1 Peter 2, um, 9 is the one we're actually explicitly called a nation. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. So that, that's the way the church is described in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, as a nation of people. Uh, Burkhoff continues, Infants were considered during the Old Dispensation as an integral part of Israel as the people of God. They were present when the covenant was renewed. Listen to these passages. Deuteronomy 29, um, 13 or 29.10, you see that? They didn't have children's church back in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 29.10 of the covenant renewal in Moab. As all of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, the one who cuts your wood and the one who draws your water, everyone that was part of households was, was brought to these meetings. Joshua 8. Verse 35, 
There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel. In fact, real quick, I want to I look at the uh, Septuagint here. <clears throat> all of the assembly of Israel. Let's see, in Joshua 8.35, if I can find it here, Israel. Okay, Joshua. Um, I'm looking for the word, I think. Man, that's weird. Why is the Septuagint doing that? That's weird. Anyway, that's the... Uh, let me pull up the Hebrew here. Why is it doing that? It's putting up like a whole bunch of verses. Okay. Um, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of um, Israel. Israel. Kahal. There it is. Kahal. Kahal means what? Church. Assembly. Convocation. Congregation. Oh, come on. Pull up the Septuagint here. Well, I have never seen Bible Works do this before. This is really bizarre. Why is it doing that? Anyway, I bet you almost anything that the, the Septuagint has that as um, uh, Ecclesia. Um, I, I know that the term Ecclesia is used over and over and over again to translate um, Kahal um, because that's, that is what it means. It means church, assembly, congregation. Joshua 8.35. Okay, Joshua 8.35. Okay, um, doo -doo -doo. anyway, all right, so the little ones were there as part of the church. They were part of the kahal. They were part of the congregation. They had been circumcised. They had been given the sign. They were part of the, the church, okay? And then, uh, Second Chronicles 20, verse 13, Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. So you're talking babies, children. Everybody, they were all there um, together, all there together with their little ones, their wives, the, the, the paideia, um, all, all of them were together. All of them were, were together. Children, babies, little ones, wives, the whole congregation was together there. So infants had a standing in the congregation of Israel and were therefore present in their religious assemblies. In view of such rich promises as those in Isaiah 54:13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. That's a promise. Um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah um, 31, 34, um, which says, No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Says the Lord, for I will give, forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Okay, from the least of them, from the little ones to the greatest. Okay, and um, we would hardly expect the privileges of such children to be reduced in the new dispensation and certainly would not look for their exclusion from any standing in the church. Jesus and the apostles did not exclude them. Matthew 19, 14, that's where Jesus says, Suffer the, let the little children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. Peter, in preaching in Acts chapter 2, the promises to you and to your children and to as many as are far off, um, there, the, the you and your descendants language, Given the fact that Paul explicates the, the doctrine of justification and our salvation in terms of the Abrahamic prom promise, and it was so integral to the apostolic preaching, you and your children, they would definitely have harked back to the Abrahamic covenant and to the prophecies of the new covenant, which say you and your children as well. 1 Corinthians 7, 14, there's another passage. I think it's de definitely relevant to this. Children are hagias, they're holy, as opposed to akathartas, unclean. Um, those terms are used in juxtaposition with one another in the Old Testament like 150 times. Clean meaning, or holy is a part of, part of being in the camp, the assembly, the church. And then akathartos, unclean, uh, being outside the camp, not part of the, the community of faith. Okay, Burkhoff continues. Number four, in the new dispensation, baptism is by divine authority substituted for circumcision as the initiatory sign and seal of the covenant of grace. Scripture strongly insists on it. That circumcision can no more serve as such. Okay? Baptism um, has taken its place. Okay, Acts 21, 21. And they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to, their, to our customs. Circumcision is no longer the, the initiatory right. It has, it has passed away, and there's many other passages to that effect. Obviously, the whole book of Galatians really emphasizes that point. 
But it would, again, it would not have been of any use to simply say, hey, baptism has replaced it. Because people would have made the same mistake with baptism. Okay, so believing in Jesus plus baptism is what justifies us before God. The reason they don't talk about the, the replacement of circumcision with baptism is that's not the question they're answering in Acts 15. That's not the question that came up. That, that baptism had replaced it, or that baptism was, was the sign of the new covenant in Christ, that wasn't a question. The question was, are we justified by being circumcised and keeping the, the law? And the New Testament is very, very clear, no. And in fact, that was never the case. Justification has always been by faith alone, by belief alone. Okay, uh, Brokoff continues, if baptism did not take circumcision's place, then the New Testament has no initiatory right. But Christ clearly substituted it as such in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, Mark 16. It corresponds with circumcision and spiritual meaning, as circumcision referred to the cutting away of sin and to a change of heart. We've already looked at all those passages, just one more here, Ezekiel 44, 7. In admitting foreigners, uncircumcised and hardened flesh, to be in my sanctuary, profaning my temple, when you offer to me my food, etc. You see what he's saying there? You're letting uncircumcised people be part of the, the sanctuary there in Ezekiel. So baptism refers to the washing away of sin, Acts 2.38, 1 Peter 3.21, Titus 3.5, the washing of regeneration, and to spiritual renewal. We have been baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, that we would be raised to walk in newness of life. Colossians 2, 11 and 12, I think this is a, a fairly difficult passage for the other side to, to interpret. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now immediately people will hear that and say, yeah, buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God. And my response to that has always been to just quote Romans 4.11. And Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness which he had by faith. Abraham believed and then was circumcised as a sign of his faith. And yet that was given to people who were too little to make a profession of faith. So the connection of baptism to faith is not an argument against um, our position on this. <clears throat> the last passage clearly links up circumcision with baptism, that's Colossians 2, 11 and 12, and teaches that the Christ circumcision, that is, circumcision of the heart, signified by circumcision in the flesh, was accomplished by baptism, that is, by that which baptism signifies. But if children receive the sign and seal of the covenant in the old dispensation, the presumption is that they surely have a right to receive it in the new, to which the pious of the Old Testament were taught to look forward as a much fuller and richer dispensation. Their exclusion from it would require a clear and unequivocal statement to that effect, but quite the contrary is found. As was pointed out in the preceding, the New Testament contains no direct evidence for, infant, for the practice of infant baptism in the days of the Apostles. Lambert, after considering and weighing all the available evidence, expresses his conclusion in the following words, quote, The New Testament evidence then seems to point to the conclusion that infant baptism, to say the least, was not the general custom of the apostolic age, end quote. But it need not surprise anyone that there is no direct mention of the baptism of infants, for in a missionary period like the apostolic age, the emphasis would naturally fall on the baptism of adults. Moreover, conditions were not made, uh, were, were not always favorable to infant baptism. Converts would not at once have a proper conception of their covenant duties and responsibilities. Sometimes only one of the parents was converted, and it is quite conceivable that the other would oppose the baptism of the children. Frequently there was no reasonable assurance that the parents would educate their children piously and religiously, and yet such assurance was necessary. At the same time, the language of the New Testament is perfectly consistent with a continuation of the organic administration of the covenant which required the circumcision of children, and there he cites a number of passages that we've already read. Moreover, the New Testament repeatedly speaks of the baptism of households and gives no indication that this is regarded as something out of the ordinary, but rather refers to it as a matter of course. Acts 16, 15, listen to these passages. Acts 16, 15. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful, come to my house and stay, etc., and then Acts 16, 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Burkhoff continues, It is entirely possible, of course, but not very probable, that none of these households contained children. And if there were infants, it is morally certain that they were baptized 
along with the parents. The New Testament certainly contains no evidence that persons born and reared in Christian families may not be baptized until they have come of years of come to years of discretion and have professed their faith in Christ. There is not the slightest allusion to any such practice. Okay, I'd also point out, um, I think most would, would recognize that um, there are a number of things in the book of Acts that, would, that are unique to it being a transitional and missional um, period, uh, like the speaking in tongues in Acts 2, chapter, chapter 2, chapter 8, chapter 10, and chapter 19. We would not look at that as normative today either. Okay, let's see, how long have we been doing this here? We are, ow, just over one hour. Okay, I'm going to put a bookmark here in Burkhoff. There's actually quite a bit more um, to come. Um, but I think it's a good place to stop. Uh, you'll notice uh, in Burkhoff's explication of infant baptism, no reference of any kind whatsoever has been made to one's understanding of the specific nuances of the Mosaic Covenant. None. Nothing. Uh, and in fact, what he says is almost identical to what, to what I've said because I think he's right. I, I don't think that... Um, the Puritans and all the Westminster divines and every major theologian in the entire history of the church, I don't think that they were as confused um, as, as is often alleged, that they didn't have this massive, huge contradiction in their thinking. I think that their position makes the most sense out of both the teaching of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and especially the way the New Testament writers interpret the promises made to Abraham. So I hope that that's been uh, helpful. There was one, one final uh, quotation one from um, a Joel Beakey's A Puritan Theology, um, which does a real good job of, of explaining paedo-baptism. There's a whole section on, on paedo-baptism in there. And, uh, and towards the end of that, there's a really helpful uh, quotation, if I can uh, find it here. Um, let's see. Uh, really good quotation on the basis of infant baptism as it's historically been, been understood. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, Beaky uh, wrote that book, I think, with Mark Jones, um, <laughs> A Puritan Theology, uh, Doctrine for Life. It's a really good book. It's a really, really a great a compilation of, of primary source quotations and just some of the best insights of the Puritans. Yeah, here it is. Now listen to, to uh, what Beaky points out here. Uh, if you understand what, what the Puritans believed about this and why they taught what they did about it, listen. Reformed theologians have always made it clear that the warrant for pedo baptism does not come from Moses. Okay, I hope that registers. Reformed theologians have always made it clear that the warrant for pedo baptism does not come from Moses. I've also made that clear in, in my own teaching and preaching. Uh, Beaky continues. Nowhere do we read of anyone contrasting the new covenant with the promises made to Abraham. There was indeed disagreement concerning what is meant by the old covenant and how it relates to the new covenant, but reformed theologians all affirmed that the new covenant was the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. Indeed, there is nothing substantially different between the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant. Now, if anyone's listening to this, who, who else have you heard say that? Me. Over and over and over and over again. There is no substantial difference between the Abrahamic Covenant and the New Covenant, except that the latter is the fulfillment of what was only a promise in the former, which is why Reformed theologians had no difficulty affirming a covenant of grace that included God's gracious dealings with the church from the time of Adam to the time of Christ. One may argue that the New Covenant is different in kind than the Sinaitic or Old Covenant, as did Owen and Goodwin, and I'm not putting myself in the same category, and Hines. <laughs> Tried to argue that, among others. Okay, listen. But Owen and Goodwin could join with those who viewed Old and New Covenants as one in substance to affirm paedo-baptism because all agreed that the command to baptize infants was based on the perpetual promises made to Abraham, the father of many nations, and not derived from any law or ordinance of Moses. That's what I have labored to make clear. It's not registering, of course, but I've tried to make that clear. Now listen to the last sentence. Of course, the argument that Abraham, not Moses, provides the rationale for paedo-baptism has been acknowledged by the more learned anti-paedo-baptists, end quote. 
So, those who insist that, hey, your whole position falls apart at Moses and the Sinaitic Covenant, are they are they the more learned or unlearned anti Baptists? That paragraph is very telling. It's very telling, and I think it, it really really explains a lot of, of the um, rather unpleasant haranguing um, that I've had to deal with uh, of late on this topic. So, I hope that that's been helpful. I hope that you'll see uh, the truth of what Beaky points out in his book, A Puritan Theology, and what, um, or what, yeah, what he point, and what Burkhoff says in his Systematic Theology. I'm going to do uh, another installment of this because there's quite a bit more. There's objections that he answers and does a, a great job answering them. But I hope that that's clear. I hope it's simple and straightforward why we, we believe in infant baptism and there, there'll be more coming uh, on that. And uh, I would encourage people who have access to Burkhoff, you can get the Kindle version of his systematic theology. It's not very expensive from Amazon. Uh, but I hope that you have found this to be uh, helpful and edifying. And thank you for watching or for listening.